Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. The question I'd like to address with you this evening is, should spirituality inform the practice of medicine? What I'm going to attempt to argue is that this is fundamentally a misleading and inaccurate question. And over the next few minutes, I'm going to attempt to show you that we should be asking a very different question. Let's begin by thinking about the dying processes as they occurred for more than a millennia in the West. According to the historian Gunter Rees, he described a typical dying pro the typical dying process, especially as it would take place within the monasteries who would care for those who are sick and dying. Rees, he says, first the dying person confessed and then received the sacrament of extreme unction from the cleric who had heard confession and had absolved him. The administration of hol holy oil occurred on the traditional places of the five senses and the other bodily areas considered to be suffering. Some brethren remained with the dying inmate throughout the day and night, praying and reading from the scriptures by candlelight. The point of this vigil was to ensure proper passing. Nobody should be left to die alone. If death became imminent, the whole monastic community was summoned and the monks congregated around the sick on both sides of the bed alternatively to pray and sing. Now this painting is uh, the painting of, of St. Francis uh, dying and who died in 1226. Uh, France, this is uh, on his deathbed. Uh, St. Francis had bread brought to him and broken as he was dying. And then he took the bread and distributed it among those present saying, I have done my part. May Christ teach you to do yours. And then wishing to give a last token of detachment and to show he no longer had anything in common with the world, Francis removed his poor habit and lay down on the bare ground, covered with a borrowed cloth, naked, rejoicing that he was able to keep faith with his lady poverty to the end. After a while, he asked to have read to him the Passion according to St. John, and he praised God for the new life he was about to enter upon on his death. I would describe this kind of dying here in a monastic community and yet also uh, with the service of medicine in which the soul is considered primary. Now let's consider today's death in a different picture. Where no longer, I would argue, is the soul primary, but the body is primary. Consider the words of physician Sean Morrison writing in the New England Journal, describing a, a particular patient in a case. Writing about this patient, he says, despite repeated requests that, he, that the patient receive no further diagnostic interventions or life-prolonging treatment, that he be allowed to return home to die, the patient underwent a lung biopsy, three T, C, CT studies, daily phlebotomies, and the assertion of multiple tu tubes. He was tied to a bed for 29 days so he had not remove the intravenous lines or feeding tubes and he spent the last month of his life in the hospital. Recent reports suggest that his case unfortunately is not unusual. I find that the comparison of these two, these two pictures extremely powerful of two, two kinds of deaths. One in monastic medicine, the other in biomedicine. Let's compare these two deaths. One uh, that historian Philip Aris in his book Western Attitudes Towards Death, one he calls a tame death and the other a medical death. A tame death according to Aris is when death is seen as familiar and expected. It was ritually organized by the dying person himself. The dying person was the active agent in managing his or her own death. The, bed, the dying person's bedchamber became a public meeting house, including family, neighbors, and children. 
uh, Sultan Heatson in his book, The Cancer War, departed that this old kind, uh, described this old kind of death as those who would depart easily, as if they were moving just into a new house. In comparison, a medicalized death, in which no longer is death tame, expected, familiar, but now in, within our current culture, death is a surprise. It's unexpected. It's wild. It's moved from the house to the hospital. And even hospitals have their own ways of tucking away those who are dying and those who have, dead, who, who have died. No longer is the patient the active agent in his dying, but the active agents are medical professionals. The passive agents are, are the dying persons in their families. Death in our culture and even within the medical institutions has, according to Aris, become a social taboo. It's forbidden. It's wild and untamable. It's, as he described, a new, the new cultural pornography, the thing that we won't talk about, the thing that we can't talk about. And so here we are at two kinds of death. And I wonder, how did we get from one to the other? How have we traveled this far from the soul being primary to the body being primary? What factors have created this shift? Let me name a few as I attempt to reconstruct some of this story. First, according to historian Gunter Rees, he, he argues that hospitals have become now houses of high technology, which provide mostly intensive patient care with the aid of a wide array of powerful and complex diagnostic and therapeutic devices. They've shifted from being institutions focused on care to institutions focused on cure. They've gone from hospitality as their primary concern, which is the root word of the word hospital, from hospitality to being primarily concerned with technological action. From the historian, we go to the anthropologist, physician, psychiatrist, Arthur Kleinman, who describes this characteristic of the biological reductionism that now dominates the practice of medicine. He writes, the everyday priority structure of medical training and of healthcare delivery with its radically materialist pursuit of the biological mechanism of disease, he says it precludes such inquiry into how a patient gives meaning to his or her illness experience. And so we've gone from institutions of high technology with an emphasis on the biological reductionism combined also with a sociological perspective of the medical profession itself, which has become autonomous from religious communities. Sociologist Jonathan Imber, he argues that in the 1850s, the medical profession was authorized and given credibility by Protestant clergy in the United States. With that authorization, physicians went from being seen as potentially quacks to being ones who were received with authority and with uh, the ones who had great uh, moral privilege and who were those who were caring. Interestingly, uh, Imber describes that in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, the medical profession radically began to distance itself from the, rel the religious communities and the clergy who gave them their credibility in the first place and became an, in, an individual and an autonomous profession that no longer was seen as ha being credible because of religious endorsement, but because of its scientific endorsement. Now combine this with a philosophical perspective, and I turn to Charles Taylor in his book, A Secular Age. In Taylor's important book, he writes, a secular age is one in which the eclipse of all goals beyond human flourishing becomes conceivable, or better, it falls within the range of an imaginable life for masses of people. The imminent frame, as Taylor describes it, is a constructed social order that reconfigures space, time, rationality, and the nature of all, of all things in imminent terms. That is, a, full, a fully blown human social system aimed toward human flourishing 
that contains no necessary contingency on the reality of transcendence undergirding that human flourishing. We can have human flourishing as a society without anything, without any turn toward transcendence. Well, finally, I'd like to combine this with a the theological perspective. There's been not very much written from theologians in analyzing and trying to understand medicine. Uh, with one exception, or one, one particular exception, is uh, the work by Schumann and Volk in their book, Reclaiming the Body. They argue that medicine is a mysteriously animated social force that functions with quasi-divine status, they, they say. They say that medicine occupies a revered social position in which society's general disposition is worship of medicine. And they argue that the current social context operates on a spirituality oriented around fear and denial of, de of death. And so medical researchers and physicians are, they say, sanctioned with the power to preserve life and vigor and to forestall or control death. And they are understood within modern culture to represent, if not possess, godlike power. Finally, they say the project by which medicine becomes the chief mediator of the power of death is clearly in some respects a religious project, if by religious we mean pertaining to the particular objects of affection around which our lives revolve. So how did we shift from the soul as primary to the primacy of the body? Well, I kind of think of this as an equation. We now are in settings of houses of high technology with an emphasis on reductionism as being our chief way of knowing. With this particular formation of the medical profession being distancing itself from religious communities to, as Taylor has argued, a social, a social construction in which everything is framed by an imminent this worldly framework. Combine that with an underlying social fear of illness and death. And I would argue that this equals a life centered on bodily health, cure, and physical comfort as telos. That is, the medical system, these factors combined together produce produce an aim and a goal or a telos in which medicine is focused primarily on bodily health, cure, and physical comfort. And this, I would argue, is a spirituality. How do I define spirituality? I define it, spirituality as life centered in the person's and or objects of one's chief love, however individually understood and pursued. Now when you look at things such as religion and spirituality and as these terms are thrown around, it becomes important to understand that there are two types of definitions of spirituality and religion. There are substantive definitions and then there are functional definitions. In essence, a substantive definition for spirituality and religion hinges on the con particular content being included, such as the belief in God or a theistic belief, so that we call something religious or, or potentially spiritual if it has the content of theism. If it doesn't, then we don't consider it religious. In contrast to this, functional definitions focus on the role of a, of a spiritual tradition as it centers on what Paul Tillich described as the ultimate concern or ultimate meaning. And it's interesting that our whole social order within Western culture is based on a particular definition of religion. And I was just realizing this recently. The way we define religion is key in the way we understand our whole social order. And the way that we currently have defined religion is based on substantive definitions, the inclusion particularly of theism. The problem of substantive definitions is that they cannot easily classify other worldviews, which 
generally among religious scholars, they recognize as religions, such as Confucianism, forms of Buddhism. Uh, even many have, have argued that, that Marxism functions. It's, 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 a anti, uh, it's an atheistic way of thinking about the world. And yet, on a functional level, it looks a lot like a religion in all that it does. I personally favor functional definitions because they illumine how things that have a religious feel or aura, even if they don't describe themselves as religious, they operate in a way that we might call a spirituality, even when they're non-theistic. So I would suggest that theism does not make something spiritual. Rather, as this definition reflects, it's the concentration, it's the centering of one's affections one's loves. This is how we can understand spirituality. It can be theistic, it can be non-theistic. And if this def definition is correct, then I would suggest, based on that equation, this equation, medicine operates on a spirituality in which the centering affection is the body as telos, the end goal it's the fundamental aim of everything that medicine is, aims to do. And I would describe this in very simplistic terms as a spirituality of imminence. So what is imminence? Imminence is a social system aimed toward human flourishing that contains no necessary contingency on a reality of transcendence undergirding that human flourishing. It's, to use the book of, the biblical book of Ecclesiastes, it's life under the sun. And we can take the medical profession, its institutions, our ways of knowing, and we can structure medicine in all of its facets with life under the sun. We don't have to appeal to anything above the sun to give the profession, the medical institutions, or our ways of knowing. We don't have to appeal to any transcendent way to, in, to structure these things. And we can have medical flourishing without appeal to the transcendent. And so above the line, we have transcendence. Below the line, we have imminence. And what I'd like to suggest is the way the current social structures of medicine are built is that the medical profession, the institutions, and our ways of knowing are permeated by imminence, in which not only can, in which primarily there is no appeal to anything above the line. Appealing to anything above the line is considered, by definition, illegitimate and dismissed. To continue with this line of thought regarding this line of, imminent, of imminence and transcendence, how does this structure medicine? How does imminence operate? I would suggest following sociologists like Peter Berger, that we are socialized, we're all socialized very deeply invisibly, uh, what some would call even the hidden curriculum. It's an invisible socialization in which we absorb certain ways of thinking about the world. These are called plausibility structures. It's the way we make sense of arguments of whether they're legitimate or illegitimate. And as I attempt to illustrate it, in this picture, transcendence has certain characteristics and imminence has other characteristics. And this is how we make sense of the social order and this is also how we make sense of medicine. So we have these dualisms. Above, uh, uh, above the line, we have the soul and below the line, we have the body. And this is how we conceptualize our anthropological existence, how we understand who mankind or humanity is. We have the public and then we have the private, which is how we understand or conceptualize space, time, 
in social interactions. So just by way of example, are we in a public space or are we in a private space? Well, you already know the answer to that question because we've all been socialized to understand exactly the kind of context that we're in. We know we're in a public space. And we also know, for example, that it's only legitimate to talk in a public space uh, not using religious arguments. So even the way I'm talking right now, I'm not appealing to some normative claim based on a religious tradition to explain things to you. I'm appealing to other ways of knowing, other non-religious ways of knowing, in an attempt to make a connection with you, whether you believe it or not. I'm arguing in a public way, which is an imminent way. And we're all socialized in this way. Science and religion, which is how we conceptualize the production of knowledge. Fact and value, how we conceptualize universal truth and personal feelings. State and church, how we conceptualize our political and our governmental relationships. Secular and sacred, how we conceptualize identity and ownership. Natural and supernatural, how we conceptualize causation and origin or more generally, imminence and transcendence, which is how we conceptualize meaning, permanence, and divinity. You know all of these categories, and you've absorbed them fully, just as I have. We've been taught to think in a certain way. And medicine, that hidden curriculum, teaches and forms each one of us, which I'd like to argue is a formation into a particular spirituality. Now, there's probably another way of thinking of this. It's, it's a little, this slide is a little bit more messy. But there are various factors that are working together that are intertwined with one another. The privatization of religion, the importance of arguing using universal reason rather than the appeal to particular religious traditions, the enlightenment emphasis on a rejection of tradition, uh, tradition and the use of the empirical method, uh, as well as within medicine, the, the, the the, the turning of physicians into scientists, primarily as scientists. Uh, we can also add to this uh, pluralism as well as the commodification of medicine, which is now really a, a new and very powerful factor that is shaping how we understand what medicine is and what the physician is and what the doctor-patient relationship is. At the center of this diagram, at least the way I uh, understand would understand it, is the, the optimism that Americans are, are taught to believe in, particularly regarding science, medical progress, all which has commod commodified money undertones to them. It keeps the medical institution going. It keeps people believing in the power of medicine. And yet on the other side, I think at the center of this, is, a de is within our culture a deep denial of death, an unwillingness to, under, to, to really straightforwardly accept that we are finite and that we're all going to die. And because of that, we turn to medicine with great hope and with great optimism. This model shrinks any other claim in under, or understanding of what medicine is and what the doctor-patient relationship is. It is working together as a spirituality of imminence, and it shrinks all other spiritualities. Well, let's go back to the line. I would suggest, or at least put forward as an idea, that perhaps we should reconsider how we have been socialized within these plausibility structures. And that we should consider the redrawing of the line. Why should we redraw the line? Let me give you a few reasons. One, because imminence, if I'm correct, if, we're, if, a func if we follow a functional definition of spirituality or religion, imminence, therefore, is a spiritual tradition, like any other spiritual tradition. Interestingly, as a tradition, it has based its monopoly, to go put the line back here, it's based its monopoly over the structures of medicine the professions, its institutions, its sources of knowledge, on the appeal that it is neutral, objective, toward religion. It's indifferent toward other spiritual traditions because it is not a tradition, as it would claim. I would argue, based on a 
Substantively, that is correct on a substantive definition. On a functional definition, it's, this is completely, uh, completely a misunderstanding. Secondly, I would argue that we should consider redrawing the line because imminence undermines pluralism. We give lip service to pluralism, but it does not exist currently within the social system of medicine. A truly pluralistic structure would allow spiritualities, other spiritualities other than imminence, to coexist within the same social structures. And they would have a socially sanctioned basis to influence the professional formation and identity of institutions, the professions, and our way of knowing. Now let me quickly go into a more particular example of the doctor-patient relationship. And let me compare two models of the doctor-patient relationship, what I would describe as a scientist body metaphor of understanding the relationship and a host-guest metaphor for understanding the nature of the relationship. Let me begin with the scientist body exam uh, metaphor. The rise of the physician as a clinician scientist can be traced back to the Enlightenment and has led to powerful advances in therapeutic effectiveness. It's led to many you know, amazing medical achievements. And the, the core principles are four. One, materialism. Two, reductionism. Three, empiricism. And then fourth, the objectivity of physicians. Regarding this fourth one, healers have no innate and direct therapeutic ability according to the understanding of what a physician is and what they do. They, they apply therapies as neutral agents but are not therapeutic themselves as persons. And this stands in contrast to every other healing approach that has existed in medicine, including the Hippocratic tradition, which has all recognized that the, that the physician as healer has a role directly in healing. Now, I'd also suggest that these principles have led to a dark side within the doctor-patient relationship. It has led to a dehumanization of patients and an objectification of patients. Since the physician is objective, it, 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 he tends or she tends to turn patients into objects. As uh, this 1940s movie, Dr. Cyclops, well illustrates, in which this, the, the scientist physician uh, through the, his spectacles uh, of using radiation of these, through these spectacles turns, turns pe persons into little miniature people. And it's, a, it's an interesting cynic, cynicism that exists within our culture that the physician, when given over to the work of a doctor as purely as scientist or primarily as scientist, it leads to the shrinking of people. It leads to this cyclops, this gigantic eye with power and precision, and yet without a peripheral vision and without an ability to see the whole person. And of course, the dehumanization of a patient also leads to the dehumanization of the physician. Let me quickly move on to a second model, a Christian model, which recognizes that I would describe as the host, a host-guest metaphor. We understand, well, how should a doctor and a patient relate with one another? The primary way of understanding this is not as a scientist in a body, but as a host and a guest. And again, this is interwoven deeply within the Christian tradition of the hospital being a place of hospitality. This model recognizes that the doctor and the patient are relative strangers. It also can recognize as a host that the doctor has significant authority um, over the guest who is in the host space. The other interesting and helpful thing is when we think of the doctor-patient relationship as in terms of hospitality as host and guest, we have immediate social roles that we can go to. So, you know, as a medical student thinks about engaging their patient, they can think about being a host or a hostess. And that can give them clues on how they should be engaging their, uh, their patient. The scientist is a necessary, but it's still a, it's a secondary metaphor in guiding the relationship. And finally, I would like to suggest it leads to a, a Christoce Christocentric encounter. Let me, let me just skip over to this to argue that within Christian theology, there's a recognition that the doctor-patient relationship is primarily a, theological, a theologically charged relationship. In the humanistic tradition, the doctor-patient relationship is primarily a horizontal relationship. 
It's just the doctor and the patient. Within the Christian vision of what's actually going on within this spiritual economy, there is a horizontal dimension. But the patient is primarily and first a sacrament, a sign, or a symbol of Christ the sufferer. And we learn this from the biblical text in which Christ told his, told his followers that when you received a, a sick person, you received me. And Christ identifies in a mystical way with those who are suffering. And hence, that's why we call patience, which is the Latin for sufferer. It's, they are like Christ, the sufferer. But also the physician is a sign and symbol within the Christian understanding of this relationship, a sign and symbol of the great physician, the great healer. And, and consequently, when the patient sees the doctor or when the, the, the physician sees the patient, they are first and foremost within this Christian vision to see the Christ in one another. The physician, when he sees, when she sees the patient, they are to see the Christ, the suffering patient, which is far from an objectification of patients because you can't receive Christ without receiving a true and a holy person. And imagine, and physicians have pra Christian physicians have practiced this for centuries and centuries, even within the Benedictine monastic community, when a guest or a visitor or a sick person came to the monastic community, the monastic community would first and foremost would fall on its face, prostrate on the ground, because they believed that they were in a mysterious, mysterious way receiving Christ himself. Now imagine a host, a physician host here at the Mayo Clinic receiving a patient in such a sacred way. This is what the, whether you would literally fall to the ground is another story, but this is the, the dynamic that the Christian tradition would call physicians to in receiving patients. But likewise, the patients would see, not worship the human physician, which is, there is a tendency for this, but to see through the physician, the great physician, who is the, the real source of healing. And even in a mystical way, that primarily the doctor-patient relationship is a sacrament or a sign and symbol, not a horizontal relationship between two persons, but Christ the sufferer and Christ the healer meeting one another. I'm out of time, so I'll, I'll stop carrying that forward, but if, just, as, to, just to conclude, if we were to think of this relationship, it carries important implications for how, for how physicians and medical students are to provide spiritual care. When you conceive yourself as a host, there are, you understand by being a host or a hostess what it means to engage the other. You don't impose, you invite. You don't, you don't have your own agenda, you're thinking of the agenda of your guest and you receive them as guest. And maybe we'll have time to, to, to touch on those things. Everything done according to 1 Peter 3.15 and ge with gentleness and respect, with the patient's consent. So let me just very quickly conclude by saying, I, I believe this question is, is incorrect by saying, should spirituality inform the practice of medicine? It's incorrect because it assumes that it's possible that the practice of medicine can operate apart from a spirituality. If we understand or perceive the importance of a functional definition of spirituality, I would then argue that it's not a question of if or, or should spirituality inform the practice of medicine, but how. Because today within biomedicine, my argument is, is that medicine is already operating fully with a spirituality. And the big question for us is, is this the right spirituality? Or at least from a vision of pluralism, is there another vision of, is there another way of doing medicine, of practicing medicine, so that other spiritualities may have a seat at the table? So I hope we can talk about that more soon. So we hear a good deal of talk today about faith and reason. Much of the discussion that falls under the faith and reason banner is either apologetic and asks the question, is faith itself reasonable? 
or is instead concerned with the internal task of theology and asks questions like, to what extent should reason be a source of authority in theology? Or how does the role of reason in theology relate to that of scripture or experience or tradition? Sometimes what is in view here is the extent to which philosophical or sociological or psychological insights should be used within theology. Today I want to ask a related but slightly different question. I want to address whether we should use the tools of other disciplines, often statistical tools, tools used in analyzing data, to gain insight into questions of faith and religion and belief. Michael Belboni discussed whether and how the practice of medicine should be influenced by faith. And I want to turn things around and ask whether religious life should be influenced by research. To some, this may seem unobjectionable. Many of you are probably familiar with the statistics on characteristics of the religious in America, sometimes provided by George Barna or the Gallup poll or the Pew Forum. For example, 90% of evangelicals, 72% of Catholics, and 82% of Muslims in America are absolutely certain that God exists. Or 58% of evangelicals, 42% of Catholics, 40% of Muslims, and 24% of Hindus report attending religious services at least once per week. Or even 53% of evangelicals, 58% of mainline Protestants, but only 48% of Catholics have, by age five, stopped believing in Santa Claus. <laughs> I'm afraid I had trouble finding uh, Santa Claus data on Muslims or Hindus. <laughs> In any case, these are descriptive statistics, and few would have any objections to the reporting of such data. They may at times be depressing, uh, but they also provide insight. They give us a snapshot, in some sense, of religious life in America. But what about other statistics addressing other questions? These may make us a little bit more uncomfortable. How do we feel about research inquiring into which personality factors are correlated with religious belief? Or even research on what genes might predict religious belief? What about research studies trying to assess the efficacy of prayer? And what are we to make of research studies that seem to cast faith in belief in a not so positive light? In 2009, the group of researchers with whom I now work published a study that suggested that uh, end of life cancer patients who used religious forms of coping were in fact more likely to seek out futile, aggressive, and costly forms of treatment in their final months of life. It almost seemed that the religious were less willing to die, not what we might expect. And there was some backlash from the Christian community. The late Chuck Colson criticized the research, arguing that it was an indication that medicine is becoming too dominated by utilitarian concerns and concerns about cost. On account of issues such as these, some academics have suggested that many questions of faith and belief, and even questions concerning the relationship between faith and health, should be out of bounds for modern research methods employing statistics. They argue that to use these methods to address religious questions is to give away too much ground. It is to hand over what is most important, our values, our beliefs, our religion, to researchers who may not be sympathetic to such things, to researchers who may approach and view these questions only through the single lens of empirical analysis, ignoring broader questions of theology or meaning. This may be a handing over of these questions to researchers who may not be able to proceed truly objectively, who may have their own agendas in carrying out such research. Jeffrey Bishop, in an article recently published in Christian Bioethics, articulated a set of objections to research that statistically studied questions concerning the relationship between religion and health. He argued that such research often strips faith and religious belief of its particular defining elements concerning the nature of God, the importance of worship, or the idea of salvation. He argues that research replaces 
the defining elements of deep religious belief with vaguer, generic, functional notions of spirituality, such as coping, social support, or meditation. He moreover argues that researchers examining religion and health often want to use research and even use religion itself to simply improve societal outcomes while neglecting what believers may feel is the true role of religion, a connecting with God. I do not want to argue against or downplay the potential dangers such as those raised by Jeffrey Bishop concerning research on religion and health. I think they need to be taken seriously. But I want rather instead this evening to focus on what the appropriate response to these dangers might be. In my view, the appropriate response is not to oppose research on religion and health, nor to flee from it, but rather to engage with it and transform it. The most effective approach to address the dangers and concerns is, I believe, to bring questions about particular religious beliefs concerning salvation or about God or about the afterlife into research itself. And moreover, to use such research in ways that may be of more direct benefit to churches and religious communities, and not just to medical and public health institutions. I believe that some research in the religion and health field is already of use to churches and religious communities, even if this were not the original intent of that research. And I'll illustrate this with three brief examples or case studies that I have in one way or another been involved with. I would like to suggest that the research results in each of these three cases is not simply interesting, but important. And again, important not simply within medicine or public health, but important to churches and religious communities. That such research may inform the actions and decisions of religious leaders, and that perhaps, in some cases at least, to neglect such research would be even irresponsible. More generally, I think that if churches and religious communities were to engage further and to help shape this field of religion and health, then yet more empirical research would pr prove useful to what the church considers to be its primary purposes and goals. So on to the three examples. Uh, the first example concerns research related to church attendance and mortality. There's now a fairly large body of literature, well over 100 papers, that um, suggest that attending churches protects against mortality. Now, all do eventually die, of course. Um, <laughs> but if we were to fix a follow-up period, if we were to look, say, at the likelihood of death in the next uh, 10 years, the research suggests that uh, those who attend services once per week versus not at all are about 20 to 30 percent less likely to die in the next uh, in the next 10 years. And that protective effect seems to get larger as church attendance or religious service attendance increases. Those who attend more than once per week versus not at all are about 30 to 40 percent less likely to die in the next 10 years. And the associations remain when controlling for demographic factors, such as household income, or race, or age. And the associations have now been reported in a sufficient number of studies that they're generally widely accepted within the academic community. There's still discussion as to why these associations are present, what are the mechanisms governing these associations, does church life provide social support, and is that what pr protects against um, early death? Does it have to do with lifestyle and behavior? Does church attendance affect smoking or drinking or sexual behavior? Does it have to do with prayer or meditation and the relaxation of the, of the body? Or might it be hope and belief and, and optimism? There's a theory in the psycho psychology literature that it has to do with self-discipline, that by participating in a religious community and following in its rules and regulations, one develops self-discipline, self-regulation, which is um, helpful for all sorts of different health outcomes. It's probably some complex combination of these things. One of the other interesting features of this research on religion and mortality is, it, is that it's church attendance or religious service attendance 
rather than religious identity or private spiritual practices that predict mortality most strongly. Service attendance is a more powerful predictor um, than simply solitary spirituality. There appears to be something very powerful about the communal religious experience. And it's not just social support. Social support probably only accounts for about 20 to 30 percent of the association. Communal religious experience appears to offer something more. Where else today do we find a community with a shared moral and spiritual vision, with a sense of accountability, wherein the central task of its members is to love and support one another? So how is this research relevant to the church? Well, we live in an age in which people identify as spiritual but not religious very frequently, and in which organized religion itself often has negative connotations. I think this research provides the church with support for a message that community is, in fact, important. Participation in the life of religious organizations is, in fact, important. The church can point to empirical data that it is not just belief that matters, but attendance and community participation as well. We may know that community is important theologically. We now know that community is important empirically, too. Such research is, I believe, useful to the church. As a second and somewhat briefer example, I want to discuss some related research on service attendance and depression. It turns out service attendance predicts, um, uh, seems to have a protective effect on depression um, as well. Those who attend services are less likely to become depressed going forward. Those who are already depressed and are attending religious services are more likely to recover from their depression. And in fact, there's, there are similar associations with many different health outcomes, including mortality, heart disease, cancer survival, depression, anxiety, even overall life satisfaction. Service attendance appears to have beneficial effects on all of these different outcomes. But with depression, there's also an interesting association in the reverse direction. While it appears to be the case that those who attend religious services uh, are less likely to become depressed going forward, it's also the case that those who are depressed are more likely to stop attending religious services. So how is this research relevant to the church? Well, pastors and priests uh, often provide pastoral counsel. It's seen as part of their role to those who are in need, who those who might be down or depressed. But what this research suggests is that those who may be most in need might not be around to receive such support. They may have already left the church. One obviously doesn't want to enforce church attendance, and certainly at times churches can be uh, more of a hindrance uh, than a help. But one could envision systems being put into place to help identify um, those in need, those who have become depressed, um, to raise awareness for um, pastors and, and priests of such individuals to provide support before they do leave. I think this research helps raise awareness of these issues. And so I think in this case also, the empirical research is again useful and important for churches and religious communities. The empirical research helps inform churches and church leaders that those who may be most in need may be the least likely to be present to receive it. They may need to be sought out. As a third example, I'd like to return to the controversy I mentioned earlier over the associations between religious coping and seeking out futile aggressive and costly treatment at the end of life. Again, the research suggested that for terminal pe cancer patients, religious coping was associated with seeking more aggressive treatment. But it turns out the picture is somewhat more complex than this and depends critically on the source of um, spiritual care. If spiritual care is provided by religious communities, the patient's religious community, then it turns out that those receiving such spiritual care from the religious community are in fact more likely 
to request aggressive care. And those who are highly religious and receive spiritual care from the religious community are even more likely to demand aggressive care. However, if spiritual care is provided by the medical team, by a nurse or a physician or a chaplain, where the spiritual care is integrated with the medical care, with the patient's prognosis, it turns out that patients who receive spiritual care from the medical team are less likely to demand aggressive treatment. And those who are highly religious and receive spiritual care from the medical team are even less likely. So religion seems to have an amplifying effect in both directions, either for additional demand for care or, or for aggressive treatment or for much less um, treatment. What might be going on here is that the highly religious may be more likely to be willing to believe in, in miracles so that if the spiritual care is not integrated um, with the medical care, they may be more willing or have stronger desires to try every last option. But those who are highly religious may also be more willing to let go so that if the prognosis is clear, if the spiritual care is integrated with the medical care, they may be more at peace with themselves, with others, and with God, and more willing to let go. And I think this research may again provide important information for churches. First, it seems that it really does matter whether spiritual care and medical care are integrated. It affects whether patients seek aggressive treatment. It affects whether they spend their last weeks and months of life with family and friends, finding meaning and preparing to die, or in a hospital pursuing aggressive treatment. I think what we also learn from this research is that spiritual care from religious communities has powerful effects. Patients do listen to the counsel given by pastors and priests made in end-of-life decisions, and pastors and priests should be aware of this when providing counsel. Further pastoral training in end-of-life settings may be important, but I think even awareness of these issues may help uh, pastors and priests in thinking about the content of the care and support and guidance that they offer. Uh, further research, uh, examining the perspectives and practices of um, clergy in end-of-life settings is uh, going to be carried out, uh, being led by Michael Balboni and research I'm participating in as well. But here, as before, I think the research is not only of academic or medical interest, but is important to the church in the conduct of pastoral care. We've seen then three examples of research on religion and health that I think is of relevance to churches and religious communities. The research on religion and mortality, I think, points to the importance of community and supports a message of community participation for the church. The research on religion and depression helps increase awareness of individuals in need and the importance of identifying them early uh, before they leave their religious communities. The research on religion and the end of life care, I think, may help inform the content of pastoral care. So I think in each of these settings, the research is of benefit to churches and other religious institutions. But just because research can sometimes be of use to the church does not mean that we should always pursue such research. I want to briefly mention um, or return to one somewhat more controversial example that I had alluded to at the beginning of this talk. There have been studies even quite a large number of randomized trials looking at, examining, supposedly, the efficacy of prayer. Some of these studies seem to have uh, found a positive effect. Others report having found no effect. There are two reviews trying to synthesize the evidence, and these two reviews are themselves divided. One comes down on the side of there being an effect. Um, one suggests that there, there may not be. 
I don't want this evening to try to sift through the, the quagmires of the evidence for or against, but I simply want to raise this particular example because I think it's one that it's really less clear whether this research should be carried out. And objections to this research come from um, believers and unbelievers alike. Uh, those who do not share the perspective of faith on the importance of prayer have argued that these studies are wasting money and resources that could be devoted to health issues and interventions that could really make a difference. Others have objected that this is really too difficult to study objectively. Almost everyone running one of these studies has an agenda, either for or against. And so the quality of these studies is thereby compromised. There have also been objections from communities of faith. Some have argued that these trials on prayer are a putting God to the test and therefore should not be done. Um, others have argued that the form of prayer that's being examined in these randomized trials is completely divorced from what actually occurs in religious communities. Within these trials, the patients don't know whether or not they're being prayed for. Often those who are praying don't know exactly who it is they're praying for. And this is very different from the form of prayer that we see within churches, where prayer occurs within the context of a relationship, where it may involve the laying on of hands, something very different from this anonymous form of prayer being examined in these studies. So clearly objections exist to such research from very different perspectives. I don't want to come down in this talk on whether or not this research should be done, but merely to point out that there are certainly cases which are not so clear. More generally, I do not think there's always a clear line concerning what questions about faith or about religion and health should or should not be addressed with empirical research methods. Perspectives are likely to differ. But the same is true in other areas of empirical research. There's not complete consensus in psychology or in sociology or in medicine as to what questions are or are not worth devoting effort and money to. I'm not this evening going to suggest guidelines as to what questions about faith are or are not worth addressing with empirical methods, though I do think further reflection on such guidelines would be of value. But what I hope to have accomplished this evening is simply indicating that there are at least some settings in which empirical research methods can be useful in addressing questions relevant to faith. Relevant not just to academics, or to the institution of medicine, but also relevant to churches and other religious institutions. And I believe if churches were to further engage with research on religion and health and to help shape this field, this would lead to yet further research useful to the church. We have seen then that religion can have powerful effects. Religion has powerful effects on health, and powerful effects on countless other aspects of a person's life. I myself am a person of faith. I'm a Christian and have regularly participated in church communities. I've experienced the transforming power of these communities and of faith. These things have offered me an understanding of the world, a moral vision, a framework of meaning, a sense of communion with God, and a supportive and loving community. The communal part of faith has been extremely important in my life, and I believe it has shaped my life in more ways than I can begin to ponder. And I've seen participation in church community transform the lives of many others as well. Religion is, of course, not simply concerned with the promotion of health, but with well-being more generally, ultimate well-being with communion with God. While our time this evening is limited and we cannot discuss these things at great length here, I do believe that this communion comes and has come through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I believe that seeking that communion through Jesus and through the church is likewise transformative. Religion clearly has powerful effects. 
And I believe it is therefore worthwhile to use reason and the tools that we have available to understand how religion affects all aspects of life. What these research methods we have discussed essentially allow us to do is to see patterns, to see patterns that we might not otherwise see. The statistical methods give us tools that have the potential to shed insight into settings which would overwhelm the human mind if it were simply presented with the entirety of the raw data on its own. To deny the utility of such methods and questions of faith, I believe, is tantamount to denying reason in questions of faith. There are, I believe, some settings in which the application of these methods have been useful, useful to the church. For a person of faith, the use of these methods is employing the God-given potential of human ingenuity in understanding our world. As with most things, these methods also can be used for good or for evil, but appropriately employed, these tools can allow for considerable insight. Reason contributes to faith. Thank you. This is for probably for Dr. Balboni, but if both of you want to weigh in. If faith informs practices tonight's event title suggests, does that mean that those without faith are, inform, are, un, are uninformed about an important aspect of medicine? Furthermore, is it important which faith informs a clinician? Does belief in Jesus somehow have a greater therapeutic benefit than belief in other gods, for example? So, yeah. That's um, a good question. Hopefully, having um, heard a little bit of my presentation, that uh, I think very clearly everyone is operating within a faith, within a spirituality. That's my argument. It's not some people are spiritual and others are not. It's that everyone is spiritual. Everyone's operating within a faith, within a spirituality. Um, and that informs their, their care of patients in the practice of medicine. Whether one is superior to another, I don't know if we, we cannot settle that empirically. I wouldn't attempt to settle that question empirically. I think that would be a, a misuse, um, a misuse of science. Um, on the other hand, I am personally convinced that different spiritualities produce different practices of medicine and that there is no such thing as a singular medicine. But there are medicines, and those medicines are correlated or correspond or flow out of distinct and different spiritualities. And within a pluralistic society, we would all do well to begin to see that or to realize that that's, that's what's actually been happening and is happening. And the more that we begin to see that, the more space can be created within our social structures to allow different spiritualities to have Again, a seat at the table. That was a much better question than the one I actually have. Uh, there's always controversy. This is for whoever wants to take it. There's always controversy over the role of churches in society, the, whether they should have tax-exempt status, what good they're doing to people that are not a member of the faith. I wonder why the health benefits of churches are not brought out in public discourse more frequently, particularly when that's something that people that might not be of a particular faith could see as a benefit, could see as a fair trade, if you will, for tax dollars, for putting up with some things that maybe we don't always like to see. Why doesn't that get brought up more frequently? I might point to two different things. Um, I think first, it, it's simply not widely known. I think if um, church communities were more aware of this research, it might be um, cited more. Um, I think 
we could then move on to ask, well, why is that so? Why is there not um, that awareness? And um, in, in my view, it's because uh, disciplines like theology and religion and, and churches have traditionally felt that they don't have much to gain um, by these empirical methods. In most social science fields, there's a great deal of debate as to how important these empirical methods are versus um, social theory. Um, but we really don't see those debates in, in theology or, or religion for the most part. It's just viewed as settled that essentially these methods are um, not worthwhile for, for our discipline. We're, we're addressing different questions. And well, though I think that is the case for a lot of the research that goes on, within um, religion and theology. I think there are areas of overlap, areas I hope to have pointed to um, this evening. And um, I think there is potential for further um, development of, of this area and further engagement, not just by researchers in, um, in medicine or in public health, but, but those within religion too, um, some of what Michael and I are trying to do at Harvard is to start up a program on religion, health, and medicine, which is joint between the School of Public Health Medical School and the Divinity School. I think the Divinity School is an important conversation partner um, in this research. So I think as um, empirical methods are brought, at least to a certain extent, to inform um, disciplines like um, uh, religion and theology, and I think as um, there's engagement by uh, churches and religious communities, which I think would take um, even more effort. I, I think these um, results, these, these benefits, would probably be more uh, widely publicized. I have a question for our second speaker, and uh, is. Um, in clinical research, uh, the randomized controlled trials are the gold standard to find out if a treatment works or doesn't work. But when we are in behavioral science or let's say religious science or contemplative science, you're trying to say, does meditation work or does pr prayer work in a specific way? And you cannot randomize people to pray three times a day uh, versus no pray or something like that. That's, that's not a method. You cannot use that. So my question to you and, that, and me is that, where are, I mean, uh, alternative methods that, uh, or design method to kind of test those kind of hypotheses or those kind of questions? I mean, and you show some data on associative research and that you, you can ask yourself, well, what's the variance? I mean, how much of the variance is that explained or not? I mean, but, but perhaps this is what we are left with. I mean, just association uh, research. So I guess the question for you is that, as, uh, as uh, an expert in uh, statistics, and uh, what are alternative ways of designing research for those kind of contemplative science questions? That's a, a very good question. And actually, this research on religion and health constitutes uh, the smaller portion of my own research. Most of the research I do is actually trying to address questions exactly like those that you raised. How do we draw uh, causal inferences from uh, observational data? And it's not an easy question, um, but it's, it's what I devote, in fact, most of my uh, research time to. I think uh, no one would dispute that the randomized trial is the gold standard for um, establishing causal relationships. As you pointed out, in many cases with this research on religion and health, that's not possible. You cannot randomize. Um, to religion. There have been some randomized trials um, that have focused on a narrower set of questions which have used um, randomized designs. So if you restrict yourself, say, to looking at a religious population, a population that already self-identifies as religious, you could randomize a particular intervention that might encourage a form of meditation um, versus a uh, control condition and look at whether this intervention, which would only be applicable to religious and spiritual communities, is worthwhile. So those randomized trials ha have been done and, and some have found um, effects, but it's not getting at the questions which I was discussing um, in my presentation. Does something like 
service attendants really seem to have an effect on health. Um, essentially, with what, we're, what we're stuck with is, is observational data. We can't randomize, so we go out, we collect data, and we um, follow individuals uh, longitudinally. We try to control for what might be other differences in um, the different populations, the religious and the, those who are not religious. We never know whether we've done a completely adequate job of control. There are other methods which say, well, um, how far wrong would we have had to have gone in our control to completely undermine these results? These are sometimes called sensitivity analysis techniques. And these can also be useful for, I think, establishing the extent of the evidence. With observational data, we're never certain, but there are degrees of evidence. And I'll talk about some of these issues a bit more in the Grand Rounds presentation tomorrow and some of the methodologic issues with this research on religion and health. But I think it's a great question, an important one, and not, not an easy one. I'm just uh, wondering if you know of any non-religious communities or networks that provide similar health benefits to those of religious institutions. So um, there's another body of literature on, on social support and health, and social support likewise has um, very strong effects on health. Those who have um, high levels of social support, and there are different ways of assessing that, um, have much better health outcomes uh, going forward. Um, social support, I think, is only one aspect of the um, seemingly protective effect that service attendance provides for health. Again, I think the best research, at least at present, suggests that it may be around 30%, so there are definitely other pathways. It's not just social support. Um, I have not seen uh, research, but it would be interesting to, to, to look whether there was similar research on whether sort of attending a sports group or a, I don't know, a poker game or something of the sort weekly um, was protective of health. My sense is that you would find uh, benefits, in those, but those benefits would then largely be mediated by, um, by social support um, itself. And I think some of these benefits coming through other pathways, through changes in behavior or through um, various practices or maybe something like um, self-discipline would, would probably be, be less, and at least some of the other forms of um, community life. But I, th I think it's a good question, one which would be interesting to look at in more detail. All right. Thank you both for an excellent talk, very uh, stimulating and thought-provoking. Um, I'm inspired by the transcendent healer, the image from the first picture that you put up. And I just wondered if you had any practical advice on how we can kind of get back to that point where we're more tuned in with our patients, more, I don't know, hands-on or enlisting the help of um, the religious community that patients would benefit from. So just kind of a practical application. Where can we turn next to kind of implement those things or gather more information on it? Uh, just to, you know, on a very practical clinical level, um, you know, most patients have spiritual needs, um, many of which are unaddressed, um, either by their religious community or by uh, the medical community. Um, so it's, you know, it's vital that clinicians, physicians, nurses, and others within the medical system um, ask the patient um, about their religious faith, if they have any, if it's important to them, what role it plays within uh, within their decision making, um, and to plant a seed um, when they when that first meeting happens, when you uh, when you take a medical history uh, to ask the patient about their their religious or spiritual background. Um, you know, some patients are worried that if you bring up religion later in the in the relationship, they're going to immediately assume that they're dying, and because medicine can't do anything. In fact. <laughs> The, the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 uh, uh, commanded that physicians would always first ask uh, and direct patients uh, to, uh, to talk to their priest before they would be seen by the, by the physician. Um, and this was uh, 
within medieval times a way of uh, ensuring that the patient would receive spiritual support, but also ensuring that the physician, uh, that the patient would not be concerned that they were dying. And so phys physicians were, were counseled by the church uh, to do just that, right at that first meeting, bring up spirituality. Um, it's a little different now, now as it was then, but the, the principle still, still applies. I, taught, I do um, recommend to many of my friends who, um, who are Christian uh, to, uh, again, this, this, I've heard many uh, people, practicing physicians who, who have done this sort of practice, um, but to see the practice of medicine, their own practice of medicine, is not something that we have to uh, superimpose our faith to make it somehow op operate or work but uh, more specifically to see it fully and fully integrated within one's practice. Um, a, a very practical spiritual practice that a physician or other healthcare professional can follow is, um, you know, typically you're supposed to wash your hands uh, before you uh, meet, meet the patient. And uh, that's an opportunity. It's a, it's a social ritual built within the medical system, built within one's practice. And to take that, that moment uh, to, to say a, a short prayer, um, you know, following, a, again, the Benedictine tradition, you know, Lord, uh, may I see Christ in this patient, and may I be Christ to this patient. Um, and, you know, I think a, um, I have a, a close psychiatry friend who began to practice that and, and incorporate that within his own practice. And he told me a story of, in which he was um, living in Nashville. The patient was, uh, was not religious or spiritual, but he was, every time he saw this patient each week, he would be praying this very prayer. Uh, and he, and he uh, three or four months into uh, his care of this patient, uh, she finally said to him, um, Dr. Michael, you're, you're like Christ to me. And he just kind of laughed. <laughs> and he, and he, he took that as and, and received that as a sign that his prayers were indeed being being answered. You know, and I think that's um, you know I also tell uh, my physician friends um, who want to bring their faith into their practice that it's not just about um, about something doing. It's not about bringing religion or spirituality primarily to the patient, but it's also asking God into the very fabric of the practice of medicine. So for example, when you're meeting a patient and you're trying to figure out what's going on, what, what, I, what I would argue uh, within the Christian tradition, a Christian physician will pray and ask for help in the diagnosis process, asking God for wisdom, what's going on with this patient. So it's not medicine here and faith over here, but these two things being woven together. Um, you know, in the in the physician, whether they pray with the patient or not is not s quite so important. But a physician who prays for a patient and asks and invites God uh, to be the real healer through the physician um, is a way of really weaving these things together. So that that would be a few a few ideas. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.